come here and speak. It's obviously a great pleasure to be here in Thailand talking to everybody. So yeah, I wanted to talk today really about some of the resources that we have at EBI um, in, in our Kemble group. And um, I'm going to focus really on sort of two diff very different sort of databases that, that we have that have bioactivity data and patent data. And I'm going to talk about Unichem, which is a way that we can use to actually link compounds between these two databases. And I really wanted to sort of highlight this really by giving you some examples of the sorts of things that, that one can do with this sort of data. So I guess it's worth saying that all the um, resources that we have at EBI and, and the resources that I'm going to talk about today are all sort of open and freely available for anybody to use. So, um, you know, there are... Ooh, sorry. <laughs> So there are a number of different ways that you can actually access all this data and I'll, I'll sort of highlight some of this as we, as we go along. So basically the Kemble database is um, a database where we've taken data from the scientific literature. It's been manually extracted in terms of the information about the compounds and the biology and put into Kemble which we consider to be like an SAR type database. Sure, Kemble is a patent database that we acquired just a few years ago and this is using sort of text mining, extracting information about um, chemical structures and more recently um, the biology in patents into this patent database. And as I say, there's a whole range of different ways that you can actually um, either download or access this data directly. And Unichem that I'm going to talk about is a way that we can link data across our two databases but also a lot of other databases both within EBI but also um, external from other people who've been developing various databases. Oops. So um, as I say what we're doing we're trying to take the text that's in a, in a scientific article and extract information about the chemical structures in a sort of a readable format and also information about the, um, the, the, the t uh, study system that it's being measured on. So, you know, if it's a protein target, we're going to map this to protein sequences, etc. Record information about the species, etc. in the database. So just as an example, this is the sort of thing that you might get. You might get an SAR table with a sort of primary data of compound binding to a particular target. But also in these um, MedChem type journals, you also see where they've done so sort of a functional assay on, the, on a smaller number of compounds. Maybe there's also some physicochemical data. There's some data perhaps on P450 inhibition. And then there'll also be data that's been, um, you know, information like pharmacokinetic data um, that's also been measured on um, smaller numbers of compounds, maybe in different species. And we'll be recording all of this data in the, in the database. So in terms of what we have in the database, um, this is just some sort of some summary information. We also take into Kemble data that's come from PubChem, but not all the data that's in PubChem. There's a lot of sort of high throughput screening data there. And what we've done is just try to integrate data that we consider to be similar to Kemble. So where there's actually a concentration dependent endpoint like the IC50, etc. We've also got a lot of um, people are starting to deposit data into the database, so particularly around neglected diseases, malaria, tuberculosis, increasingly people are putting those sorts of data in, into Kemble. And then the other thing I think I wanted to mention was that what we really want to do in this database is try and sort of do the sort of, um, go all the way from the sort of initial um, drug discovery all the way through to, um, to marketed drugs so that you can actually try and understand the processes of you know what makes a good good drug and you know which data is going to be useful to to get to that position so we've also at the moment integrated information about the FDA drugs and I guess you've heard a lot of other talks this morning where people have done sort of similar things and you know I think it is in, important that we um, learn from things that are obviously 
obviously working when we're doing drug discovery further back. And then the thing that's missing at the moment is the link between the preclinical data. And this is a bit of work that we're doing um, in collaboration with Tudor and the um, Illuminating the Druggable Genome Project. So we've got to the point now where we've effectively identified the therapeutic, or what the intended therapeutic targets for um, compounds in the sort of the four main classes and linked this up to clinicaltrials.gov. So we've got information about the um, the clinical phase of these molecules and the, this information will be available in the next month or so I hope in, in the next release of our Kemble database. So as I mentioned there's a whole range of ways you can download the data in Kemble, you know web services downloading it, we've also got um, semantic web uh, version that we've produced and then there's obviously um, a, web, a web interface. So that was Kemble, a very different type of database that we um, acquired just a couple of years ago from Digital Science. Was um, well, it was originally called Shorechem, and we've renamed it Shorechemble. So this is a patent patent database. Now, uh, as you can probably imagine, there's vast numbers of um, patents that are published, sort of constantly, and um, we're taking data from these four, well, three main patent offices, and just the um, the abstracts from the Japanese patent office. We're going into a patent database, and then we're using um, um, text extraction of the of the names that are converting these names into chemical structures and also image to structure recognition to convert the images into structures putting this information into a database so that um, people can actually search for um, for compounds in patents so that was the system that we effectively um, acquired of course, um, immediately people say, you know, they don't want to just know about the compounds in patents, they want to know about the biology as well. So again, we've been doing some work, um, partly as part of, again, this illuminating the druggable genome, but also um, as part of a European project called Open Facts. Um, and we've been using some, um, some software to actually um, run, so it's running this text mining engine across the patent corpus to basically try and extract information about um, the genes and diseases that occur in the patents. And um, then this software actually tries to identify which of those are likely to be relevant bits of information in, in the patent. And this is now available on this um, OpenFAX API and you, you can access that using this link here. So I mentioned earlier that um, Shaw Kemble is a big database. So at the moment, uh, Shaw Kemble has about 17 million structures in it. Um, chemical structures from about 14 and a half million patterns and I guess you know it's, we're running this this um, annotation constantly so it's a totally automated system so the compounds just get annotated as the data gets released um, and we're actually annotating about 80,000 new compounds from about 50,000 patents every month so as you can see this database is growing very very quickly and it does only take a, sort of less than a week for a compound to be um, published in the patent in order for us to annotate it and it, for it to appear in the um, Shaw Kemble database. So as I mentioned, um, Shaw Kemble is something that we've only taken on fairly recently. So we're obviously still, you know, working on increasing the ways, uh, the, well, the the annotation in the database, but also the ways that people can access it. So at the moment, you can download the compounds that are in the patents on a weekly basis in Unichem. We've obviously got a web interface that's um, always updated with the current data, so you can search that with all the latest uh, versions. Um, we are also providing quarterly downloads of the the chemical structures with the, um, the patent, so what we call the um, compound patent map. Um, as I mentioned through this OpenFAX API you can access the information in the patents including the bio annotation that's been done. 
And then obviously there are a lot of people, particularly in pharma companies, who um, you know, want it to be secure in terms of you know, what they're searching for. So we've set up this system that um, you have to do a bit of work yourself, but we can give you access to the, the live patent, patent database so that you can integrate this behind your own firewall. And that, but this, this at the moment is just based on the, on the chemistry. So as I say, we've got these two very different databases um, at EBI and I guess hopefully you can see because one's totally automated and based on text mining whereas the other is based on manual extraction. It's not um, immediately easy or simple or sensible to try and integrate the two into a single database but obviously what we want to be able to do is to link between the two. Um, and we've also developed this system at EBI to try and do this in terms of the chemistry. So we call this system Unichem and it became quite apparent to us, I guess, a number of years ago that there are an awful lot of databases um, out there and we've also got a number of different databases um, even within our own organisation that all have information about chemicals in. And I guess as a researcher what you want to be able to do is say I'm interested in this particular compound, what other databases is there also information on, on about this compound. So um, we do this using this Unichem system. So how do we do this? So basically we do this using, using the use of inches and inchy keys. So you can take a chemical structure, code it up into um, this sort of line notation that represents the chemical structure called the inchy, and from this you can develop a, um, a key based on this. So basically um, Unichem is just a database that contains the inchy, the inchy key and the database identifier. So the, um, the inchy key is used as the link effectively that links together all the different identifiers from different databases. So just showing this in a, in a bit more detail, um, this particular compound, this is the inchy key and using that key you can actually see that um, you know, these are all the different identifiers in a whole range of different databases. These are the source databases and on the interface you can, these are actually all um, hyperlinks to the actual compound page for that compound in all those respective databases. So, you know, just some examples of the sorts of things you can do. You can link to data in Kemble, the patent database, um, crystal structures, molecules that you might want to buy, etc., etc. Um, and, you know, this is a very big database. We've now got over 100 million structures in it, and we're actually annotating data at the moment from um, 27 different databases. And this is again fully available, there's a list of the sources that you might want to use and as I say, because all these external databases are being updated regularly, we're updating Unichem uh, regularly so again you will be able to um, get the sort of, you know, the latest data from these, um, these weekly downloads. So this, is, this, is, this works fine, but it is just an exact match across um, different databases, so where exactly the same compound is found in different databases. But what we found, for example, is that this compound peroxetine, which is a, a drug molecule, we have in our Kemble database a number of different structures that are not exactly peroxetine but they are slightly different. So for example, we've got one here with no stereochemistry, one which is a salt with no stereochemistry, one where there's only one stereocenter defined, um, one where you've got um, different stereocenters, etc. Now, um, you know, without looking at this in a lot of detail, I don't know whether these were you know, some of these very specific stereo differences were actually designed like that or whether there are errors in the database. But either way, it seemed potentially useful for people who were interested in this compound to actually see the data um, on these related compounds if they so wished. 
and it turns out that you can do this quite simply using the using the inchy. So this is the inchy and inchy key for peroxetine. Um, these compounds that have different stereochemistry or no stereochemistry, the first part of the inchy key is identical, and it's only the second part that's um, that's that's different. So by matching on the first part of the inchy key, we can identify the relation that the, these two are related to this compound. And um, you can do this for a whole range of different things. So you know, you might not only have things that have got stereochemical differences, but there might also be differences in uh, you know, the presence of isotopes. And again, it's potentially useful to be able to identify these, even though the, sort of the whole structure is apparently different. So the question is, what about salt? So again, you know, different researchers might be using different salts for their, for their studies. So again, can we um, identify the fact that uh, you know, this is just a salt of peroxetine? So here, if you look at the, um, the inchy key for this salt, it's totally different from the inchy key for peroxetine. However, it does, if you look at the actual um, coding of the inchy itself, you can actually split out the different layers of the inchy into the two component, component parts. So um, if you do actually do this, so the, you know, the red parts here refer, are effectively the inchy for peroxetine, and this is for the salt, and then if you work out the inchy key for that, you're then back to um, matching in the inchy key for peroxetine. So this enables us to not only link compounds that have got the same stereochemistry, isotopes, charges in them, but also um, we can actually link together compounds that are uh, effectively salts. And this is done fairly simply, just programmatically. So um, if you do this across all the databases we've got in Kemble, so peroxetine itself is found in 18 different databases, but all these other forms and the, are, are also found in various other databases that we're linking to. And then again, you can do this for, um, for the salts, and we see again there's a, a, a large number of different sorts of salts that have been reported in different, in different databases. So thinking now about the, um, our two Shaw, Kemble and Kemble databases and the data that we have in them, so, um, so I was saying earlier, obviously they're very different sizes. Uh, there's about 19% overlap in terms of um, um, compounds that are in Kemble and are in Shaw, Kemble. And if we use this connectivity mapping, this increases to about 22%. So it does increase the number of, of compounds that you might find that might be of interest. So I guess it's perhaps not a surprise to people that lots of people are interested in drug molecules and there are lots of different databases that effectively incorporate these molecules. And I think there's a lot being written in the literature about, you know, trying to work out what's the definitive structure for some of these things and it's not quite as simple I think there isn't really a definitive source that I know of that gives these structures um, and you know you would expect perhaps that all the compounds in drug bank we would have in Kemble and um, this FDA database etc um, but it turns out that that you know if you're doing exact matching that's not exactly the case and I don't think it's necessarily that everybody's um, made errors obviously there are errors in these databases but part of it is to do with the limitations there are in using the mole files that people tend to uh, tend to use to define some of these chemical structures but you can see that if you use the connectivity mapping you are actually seeing a lot more maps together so it's quite um, potentially quite useful I mean we've used this to try and identify potential errors in structures in our databases and obviously it's a way of linking these compounds together across, across databases. 
So this again is just to show that you know it is fairly common across um, a whole range of databases. So this is just showing the um, the links between compounds in Kemble and the other databases that we have in in Unichem. And you can see the so the red bars refer to the connectivity mapping as opposed to the exact matching and you can consistently see that if you use that you're seeing more compounds that could be identified as potentially the same or potentially of interest um, across these two these databases. So we actually use the um, Unichem web services in, um, in our Shaw Kemble database to actually provide links from compounds in patents out to other, out to other databases. Um, and in Kemble, we're actually using the connectivity mapping on the interface. So for example, this is again just the as a sub part of the web page for um, peroxetine. So you can see these are all the databases that have exact matches in. These are ones where there's um, the stereochemical differences, isotopes differences, protonation differences. And then obviously you have all the different permutations and this also enables you to, to see all those. So it does become sort of complex, I guess, quite quickly. So one other thing that um, we've been quite interested in trying to understand is the sort of the value of the data in the Shaw Kemble database and Kemble. So one thing that um, we were quite interested in was, you know, when do compounds first appear in the literature relative to when do they first appear in, in, um, in the patterns? So if you take um, all that, that overlap of the compounds that appear in Kemble, and um, Shaw Kemble, you can actually see that basically it's a sort of a two year on average difference in the time that it appears. For drug molecules, it's, it's actually interestingly, it's longer, so it takes longer for drug, things that are ultimately being marketed as drugs to actually appear in the, um, in the uh, scientific literature, which wasn't exactly what I was expecting, but I guess people are a bit more reluctant about publishing in the medicinal chemistry literature things that maybe are ultimately going to be uh, drugs. And then the other thing that um, we did as part of the work that we're doing for the um, Illuminating the Druggable Genome Project was did the same thing but compared the targets across different databases. So, you know, what, how long is it between the time that a target appears in the patents versus the, um, the chemical literature? And um, you know this is basically four or five, four or five years. So um, I'm obviously overrunning a bit here. So I'm going to quickly mention just a couple of examples of things that we've done. So you can take a particular um, compound against a target that you can find in um, in Kemble. In Kemble, there's obviously a lot of sort of rich data on the the compound itself. Um, you know, not just the binding data, but sort of functional data, etc. And um, you can actually then, you know, you can see that data. But if we go to the um, into the patent, the patent, we can go into the patent data, and again, we can look at the data that's on that particular compound. So there's about 45 different patents mentioning that compound, and they, in this case, they're appearing a couple of a couple of years ahead of the time that they appear in the chemical literature. Um, and again, if we want to look from a target perspective, we can see when the target information on this orexin target first appeared in the patents versus the chemical literature. And you can see there's a large number of um, patents that mention orexin that you know, potentially might be worth, might be worth looking at. And you can go back and do sort of analysis where you can look at on, um, on that orexin target all the different um, scaffolds, for example, that have, that have been measured, mentioned in the Kemble database. And obviously in the patent literature there's an awful lot more different scaffolds where people have enumerated all the different sorts of um, 
examples of you know different substitution patterns of nitrogens round rings etc so if you're looking for ideas of things to work on um, you know you probably want to want to look at both of these um, we can look at things from a different perspective so you can take a, a substructure search in um, in Shaw Kemble and um, you can do a search there you can identify all the compounds that contain that particular substructure in this case it's nearly a thousand compounds and you can you can map these to Kemble and see that basically about 64 of those have actually got bioactivity data but that bioactivity data includes not just binding to targets but also to um, to other that, but there's also other other types of data and you know this is again just showing you you've got the substructure search that you did um, if you actually look at when these compounds uh, the compounds with that substructure appear in the patent literature and versus the um, the medicinal chemistry literature you can do all these sorts of analyses so I think just really going on to sort of summarize what I, I hope I've managed to sort of show this afternoon is you know these are two very different databases we've got automated extraction versus manual extraction um, you know obviously because you're automating this um, you know, the accuracy will not be the same as doing the manual extraction we do see though that in the patent literature things are, are basically appearing earlier than they are in the uh, medicinal chemistry literature and of course this information is entirely qualitative whereas you know we do have quantitative data in the Kemble database and also um, Unichem is a way that we can actually use to link, link between these two databases um, just obviously if you want any more information about any of the things I've been talking about there's a number of papers that we've published and a number of, of links here that you can actually use and obviously last but not least I want to acknowledge the work that's been done by um, all the people in the Kemble group and some of the people who've, um, who've left in particular John Overington who was the guy who basically brought the um, Kemble database into the public domain for you, you and everybody else to, to use and obviously um, all the people who we've collaborated with and have been funding this work so thank you very much Thank you.